I started my journey um, as a value investor uh, 22 years ago, and I uh, quite by accident uh, heard about Warren Buffett for the first time. And unlike you, uh, when I heard about him, I was 30 years old, so I was much older. And uh, and when I uh, when I read about him, I was really stunned. I basically so I I have I haven't been to business school. I'm an engineer by training. Um, all of you probably know a lot more about finance than I do. Uh, but but I was really stunned uh, with Warren Buffett's approach and the way he had been so successful. And uh, the crux the crux of his success, at least what I took away f- from what I read in 1994, was uh, a quote by Albert Einstein, which is, uh, compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. And, um, and so even though Einstein was a physicist, he actually figured out a few things about uh, about compounding, and um, you know, obviously in '94 when I read about Buffett, he had been compounding at the rate of about 25, 26 percent a year, and 26 uh, percent is a magical number. Uh, and I thought of the magical number then because if you compound money at 26 percent, it doubles in exactly three years. Uh, so if you if you have a thousand dollars, you compound at twenty six percent, you're going to have two thousand dollars in uh, in three years, and so on. And um, if you if you go for thirty years, uh, that's two to the power of ten. And this group doesn't need me to tell you that two to the power of ten is one thousand twenty four. So we throw away the twenty four; it's a thousand times your money. So if you had a thousand dollars and you compounded at twenty six percent. Uh, 30 years later, you would have a million dollars. And if you had a million dollars and you compound at 26%, 30 years later, you'd have a billion dollars. And that's basically the key uh, to to Buffett's success. And so I wanted to, I thought it was worth trying to uh, uh, do what Buffett did. Of course, no, we're never going to have another Warren Buffett. But I thought it was worth trying to uh, compound at high rates. And so I actually gradually over five years switched from being a CEO of an engineering company to eventually being a, a, a hedge fund manager. And the key the key uh, uh, nuance or you could say mental model I used was a very simple, which is I, I looked for companies that were selling for half or less than what they were worth in two or three years. So if I could find a dollar bill for 50 cents, then what that meant is that if it got valued as a dollar in two years or three years, I would be compounding at 26%. And if it happened in two years, it would be even higher. It'd be like 35, 36%. And if it happened in two years, it'd be 26%. And so I said, you know, it's worth trying to seeing if we can find these 50 cent dollars because 26% sounds high, but find, finding things that are half off in an auction driven market um, is not, I didn't think it was that hard. And I thought it was worth trying because the rewards are so high. And uh, so that's what I embarked on doing is I said, okay, let's try to find these you know, a dollar bill for 50 cents, and then you just sit back and wait for two years or three years. And, you know, markets are weighing machine in the long term, and uh, they'll get reweighed accordingly. And uh, for the most part, if I, if I look at my, uh, my performance from 95 uh, until, uh, let's say, 2014, uh it's it's done about the 26 percent approximately last two years i'm down about one third so it are taking it down a little bit uh but uh but we think in the next few years we'll make it up so uh we'll see how it goes i'll report to you next year when i'm with you in person and um but uh but this journey this uh it's been uh 21 years since i started doing this and i had a million dollars uh, in 1995, and I wanted to try to see if that million in 30 years 
could convert to a billion. So I said, okay, basically uh, we have the million. I don't really need it for anything. I'm going to try to put it in this Buffett engine of compounding and I want to see what happens to it. And the good news is that even if I miss by 90%, it's still a big number. Even if I miss by 95%, it's still a big number. They're all acceptable numbers. So it's it sounded like a good game to play. And uh, when I first set up my uh, the first set of stocks I bought in uh, 1995, and this is, you know, I had one year of experience reading about Buffett. I didn't have a lot of experience. Uh, I hadn't uh, gone to business school, et cetera. And uh, so I, I uh, basically used to just, uh, if I found a company, I would make a 10% bet. So my portfolio of a million stocks basically got a uh, million dollars got divided into 10 stocks. Okay. And um, so I bought these 10 stocks, but then I had a, I had an interest at that time in making uh, investments in the Indian market because there were some companies I had noticed in the Indian stock market that looked very compelling. And uh, it was very complicated at that time in uh, 94, 95 to invest in India, especially as a U.S. resident. And uh, for example, they didn't have DMAT. So if you bought shares, uh, this is like 21 years ago, they gave you physical stock certificates. And also the Indian government said that if I brought in dollars and I bought Indian stocks, I'd be able to take the money back without taxes back in dollars. And the country had a lot of exchange controls. So I didn't actually believe them. You know, I was a little skeptical uh, that a country which had all, all these exchange controls would kind of honor these things that they were saying, if you will. And uh, so I was skeptical. So what I did is out of the million dollars, I only allocated $30,000 to India. And the $30,000 I allocated to four stocks. Uh, so I had to physically go to Mumbai. I opened a brokerage account, opened the bank account, and then I bought these stocks. And then a few weeks later, I got these physical stock certificates in California, and they were almost falling apart. Like they looked like they almost were worthless. They looked so beat up. And um, so one stock I bought, which was half of the 30,000, 15,000, uh, was an IT services company. That was the business I was in and uh, Satyam Computers, and then three others. There was one, uh, one was a broker through whom I bought the stocks, and two were courier companies, if, you know, kind of like FedEx or uh, DHL, because India had very bad uh, postal system. So I thought that as the economy grew, these, uh, these companies that were basically uh, doing what the postal system should be doing, but were doing it in private ways, like FedEx and DHL and UPS. Um, so, uh, and I, I, I thought these were all very long-term plays. So when I got these certificates, I said, okay, I'm gonna stick them in my drawer and not look at them for 10 years, just let them be. But what I noticed is after about five years, uh, one of the stocks, the IT company, Satyam Computers, I had bought it for 45 rupees and it was trading at 7,000 rupees. It was up 130 or 140 times what I paid for it. And um, and at that point, actually, I'd been tracking it a little bit, but I, at, in about 1999, uh, which was about four years after I bought, I said, you know, let me just study this business again because I know the business, but this is ridiculous, you know? And I noticed that the uh, the multiple it was trading at it was trading at more than 100 times earnings. It was just ridiculously overpriced. And one of the reasons it was priced that way is because they had spun off a dot-com company, which they still owned a piece of. And the market at that time was in a major bubble uh, for all these dot-coms. So this company, which was just a you know system integration IT company, had formed a, spun out a subsidiary, uh, which was doing some nifty things on the web, and the market gave that spun out company a huge valuation. And because of that, this company got a big valuation. So anyway, I thought this was complete bubble territory. And I I was also concerned the 15,000, the exchange rate had moved against me. The 15,000 was worth over $1.5 million. Um, so, you know, I started with a million dollars. I'm going to tell you what the remaining 
985,000 in a second, but 15,000 of the portfolio was sitting at one and a half million. And I was concerned whether the Indian government would allow me to take the money back, whether I could even sell the stocks, whether the shares were fake or real. I had a lot of questions. So I said, you know what, we're going to test this out. So I contacted the broker. I said, I'm ready to sell these shares. And I sent them the shares. They sold the shares. I sold within 5% of the all-time high of that company. And uh, they put the money in my Indian bank account. And then the next day, I asked them to wire it to the US and they wired it. Everything went flawless, exactly as the government had promised. No issues. Okay. I was blown away. I said, wow, no taxes. I gave them 15,000. Five years later, they're giving me 1.5 million. No questions asked. What a country. And, um, and then uh, these other stocks that I had, they were all kind of, you can say, old economy stocks. Okay. And they hadn't done much. So the remaining 15,000 maybe was worth 20,000 or 25,000, had, had not moved much. In fact, everything else was going down in price at that time, except the frenzy for the dot-coms. Even Berkshire Hathaway hit a multi-year low at that time. And um, so in 2001, uh, I decided to completely exit my Indian positions. And I sold all the, the remaining three. One of them uh, was down 50%, but the other two, we made a little bit of money, but basically for the remaining 15,000, I got like 20,000 back or something. And the overall result in India obviously was more than acceptable. You know, 30,000 in, one and a half million out is perfectly fine. Then the other 970,000 I had, there was one company I had in there which went up 100x. And I had $100,000, this US company, CMGI. Uh, went up a hundred x, so that one company became ten million, and uh, so now I had ten million in that one company. I had the one and a half million in this one Indian company, and the rest of the portfolio had done okay because at that time, from ninety five to two thousand, the U.S. markets had gone up like twenty five percent a year, so that it had moved up, but nothing like these other companies. So I had like you know, I think thirteen fourteen million dollars out of the million dollars in five years. And I said, Monish, forget about 26%. We've just kind of blown it out of the park. Very well done. Good job. I was very happy. You know, it was a fantastic job, especially for never, never having even attended a single class of the professor at Peking University. Just, you know, winging it on my own, if you will. And um, now, recently I went back. So what happened is these other stocks, when I went to sell them, the other three Indian stocks, they told me one particular stock certificate was fake. So it was a very small amount of shares, but they said it was a fake certificate. And the broker said, we're not responsible for fake certificates. So I didn't really care. It was a small amount. And I just kept that one certificate in my, in my desk. And recently I looked at it again. I said, no, it doesn't look fake to me. So I sent it again to a broker in India to sell. And I asked them, can you sell these 100 shares of this company? So now what had happened is, I had held this one company, Blue Dart, which was like the FedEx of India, for 21 years. And I held it for 21 years by accident because that one little piece didn't, didn't get sold because of this, uh, uh, because of this uh, uh, kind of fake thing. And I traced back what, because I kept getting these dividend checks all this time and all that, that uh, Blue Dart uh, was ultimately a 60x so if i had kept those shares i had, I had invested in blue dot i had invested uh, 7700 dollars and i would have had uh, about half a million uh, if i had kept those shares so then i went back and said let me check all the four stocks in india what what happened to the other three if i had not touched them because they were designed to not be touched i was stupid i sold it after 6 years so what ended up happening is that Blue Dart was 60x. There was another one, Kotak Mahindra, which was my broker. That was up 50x. And the third one, uh, which was Skypack, which was a competitor to Blue Dart, that basically went down to half. That didn't do anything. But what ended up happening in that portfolio of 14 stocks in 1995 is I had, uh, I had four 
out of the 14 that all eventually went up more than 50 times. And uh, in one of them, I had a serious position. I had a 10% position, which completely altered my net worth. And and then I, I started thinking that, you know, uh, this is not uh, this is not good that I ended up with these companies in my portfolio and I never recognize how great they were. I recognize it in two cases. In two cases, I was able to. Now, in one case, I uh, in fact, in both those cases, both the cases I I um, cashed out the hundred X were both bubble because of the bubble not because the valuations went up. They probably should have been worth 10X or 15X, but not 100X. But So we over, uh, we kind of collected more than we should have, which was fine. But but these other ones, these were real businesses like the FedEx of India, uh, the, the Goldman Sachs of India. And these were businesses I should not have sold. And I sold them. And so I started, I started thinking, how often has this happened in my portfolio? How often has it happened where we had these uh, companies where we, I was smart enough to buy them, uh, but not smart enough to hold them? And why is that happening? So what I, which is the subject of the talk today, is kind of a framework. What I dis, uh, did is so, you know, the best way to learn is to teach. So I have to admit that one of the reasons I wanted to do this, uh, this talk and this lecture is because I'm trying to learn. So whether or not any of you guys learn anything from me, I am definitely going to learn from this talk. Because what I want to do is I'm 52 years old. Hopefully I have another 30 or 40 years left. And the next 30 or 40 years, when these 100 baggers show up in my portfolio and they're guaranteed to show up, uh, I am at least smart enough to figure out that some of them are 50 baggers or 100 baggers and I hold on to them and I not sell them. 